So I finally got to see how the sausage is made. And by sausage, I mean photographic film. In this video, we look at how Ilford makes all of their film. I took a trip down to their giant factory here in the UK, and they gave me a behind the scenes look at every single process that's involved in creating their classic film stocks. You def gonna learn something in this video. Let's jump in. YouTube, welcome back to the channel. So we got a very special video today. As you can see, I made my way to the Ilford factory. Ilford is the black and white film company that we all love. Uh, they're based here in the UK. So, you know, being in London, I was able to hop on a train and get over there pretty easily. I went and checked out the entire process. So I'm hoping you get to look in here, learn a couple of things about how film is made and you know, and just enjoy the vibes. All right, y'all, let's get into it. So I'm not sure if you'll be able to tell this from the footage, but the Ilford facility is enormous. This place is basically a whole campus with a bunch of buildings dedicated to a lot of different things all very important in the process of creating film. They've got all kinds of machines and storage facilities and labs, all very important in the process of finessing and fine tuning the products that they offer to us film photographers. As impressive as all that stuff is, the most impressive thing about Ilford is their employees. They have a bunch of employees who've been around for a very, very long time and know every single thing that is required in the process of making the film that they sell. This man particularly is the one who's in charge of the entire manufacturing process. I'll let him introduce himself. So yeah, please tell us who you are. Right, I'm Kevin Hudson, head of manufacturing, so in charge of both finishing and sensitizing. Um, been here since October 82, started as an R&D scientist, so 40 years in October. Amazing, that's amazing. In my opinion, the most important thing about this whole process is the creation of the film emulsion. Let's hear a little bit from Kevin. That's um, an example of what we make. That's emulsion? So that's emulsion, so quite... Is it squishy. always in that state or is it... Yeah, generally. Um, okay. Might be a different color depending on what dyes. Sure. Um, but always in that state. From go to go, I mean, I guess maybe we'll talk about this later, but this has to become liquidy at some point, I yes. guess? Yes, um, okay. anything above about 35 degrees, It'll that'll just, be a liquid. Okay, understood. Um, so when we go over to M14, we melt that at 42 yeah, yeah. degrees to get um, a liquid. Okay. So once you've now concentrated up emulsion, um, if we were just to make a, a coated product out of that, you'd be back in the early 19th century when you had a big gotcha. hood. Yeah, so it'd yeah, be yeah. very slow, it wouldn't pick out color tones. So sure. all it would do would be pick up blue light, so it would pick up uh, matte shirt, mm -hmm. but wouldn't pick up anything else. So we have to spread that spectral sensitivity and make them a lot faster. And we do this um, by adding various dyes, yep. um, but also some um, sensitizers. And in fact, we do use a bit of gold Very cool. included in there um, that actually spreads the sensitivity and makes them much faster. And again, depending on what um, product you're using and what speeds required, you'll have decided what crystal size and how much yeah. you want to digest it to, to get the speed. So we headed down a corridor and then we went into a really, really cold storage room where all of the emulsion is kept. I cannot believe how big the emulsion is and the fact that it's a solid block. So these are the five kilogram bags of emulsion. This is a paper emulsion. And in fact, it's uh, one of the emulsions that goes into multigrade. So okay. if you once I have a feel, it's squashy, just it like that sample was. smells interesting in here. What, yeah. what am I smelling? That's just emulsion or? It's just the emulsion, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And it's very cold. And how cold is it in this room? Um, between six and 10 degrees. Okay, so that's, uh, I don't know, Fahrenheit calculator for all the Americans. Six and 10 degrees, I don't know, like 45, 50 Fahrenheit or something? Uh, it'd be less than that. Less than yeah, that, yeah. okay. It's definitely chilly. Yeah. Feels like a refrigerator in here. It is, that's what effectively it is. You don't want all this precious emulsion to start melting, no. right? <laughs> <laughs> this is the control room for the emulsion making plant. Um, as I said before, it's a very uh, automated plant. Yeah. And effectively the control system runs the plant. Yeah. So we give it a schedule and it will set things off. The guys who are normally in here would are really placement. I'm curious, I think people are gonna, from what they can see here, they're gonna see old computers. Yes. I feel like that, that must be part of the secret sauce at this point. <laughs> you know? um, we're, we're actually in the process of um, upgrading oh, really? our okay. control system. Sure, um, sure. Not so much this is just the face of what they yeah, see, yeah. but um, the system through in that room, that's where the brains of the plant oh, is. Okay, gotcha. That's what's running the process. Yeah. 
So while the emotion is the most important ingredient in the film process, the most important process itself is the coding of the film. This is what's done in Ilford's giant coding facility. This is our uh, coating plant, uh, M14. There was only actually 12 machines before, no one wanted to call it number 13. Um, so compared to our competitors, this would be classed as quite a small and slow machine. Okay. But I believe this is why we're still here, because we can do this. We can code everything we need on exactly. one machine. Exactly. People like Kodak or Agfa or Fuji would have had a big plan for paper, a big plan for film, big plan gotcha. for inkjet. Okay. We could do everything on one machine. So for me, that's one of the reasons why we're still here and some others are not. We've done various things to it, but um, effectively we can coat our fiber-based paper products, yeah. resin-coated paper products, our triacetate film, polyester film, yeah. and inkjet when we used to coat. We don't coat as much inkjet sure. now, but we used to coat all of those on here. We can coat anywhere from 0.96 meters wide to one point five, six meters wide. Yeah. Um, we caught anywhere from about 30 meters a minute up to about 110 meters a minute. That uh, sounds depending like on what product. <laughs> um, not as fast as a lot of our competitors, as I say. They okay. had very big machines going a lot faster, yeah, but yeah. Um, when the volume declined, clearly that was a struggle to run their yeah. machines compared to ours. And this uh, machine, it, this, it's existed for a very long time and obviously still works. I'm yeah. sure there's maintenance and all that. Yeah, there is. Could yeah. this thing literally just run forever technically as long yeah, as? Yeah, okay. yeah. there's obviously challenges in certain parts to upgrade certain parts yeah. of kit, but that's what we're doing. In fact, we've got some people coming in this week to look at our Intex scanner, which I'll talk about in a minute. Yeah. Um, we're looking to upgrade that as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a constant challenge to keep things upgraded, sure. but we've got no problems that we see yeah, yeah. going forward. Yeah, of course. In case it's not clear, the coding machine is actually a giant building that is self-enclosed within itself. And the innermost part of it is where all of the coding happens in a series of interconnected machines, uh, tools, and kind of systems. All of that has to typically be completely dark because that's how you coat the film. You can't have any light because film is light sensitive. So that's why we're not in there and that's why we can't show it to you um, just now. At which point in this diagram do the lights have to be off? Everywhere. The entire thing. The entire oh, thing. Oh, I guess because to where well, the outskirts of it, yeah. the machine is. So the in that middle everything third, is contained. Okay. Once you're in this area, everything is whatever light the product requires. When we're coating. When we're coating. When you're okay, fair, yeah. fair. So we have five lines in total. Um, we have um, four of them are identical. Um, the fifth is a sort of semi-automated line that we tend to use for inkjet. So we have two melt vessels, so we take the emulsions that you've just seen from the black bags, mm -hmm. split them up, put them into a melt vessel, melt them at 40 degrees and add various chemicals. We then transfer it through a filter into the cord vessel. Again, identical setup to the two melt vessels. Um, once we're in the cord vessel, we fill up what we call the coating circuit. Those have an ultrasonic debubbler to get air out. Mm -hmm. We have a pump to pump it up to the coating head. We have a flow meter to measure how much we are pumping up to the coating yeah. head. And we have a pulse damper, which takes any pulses the pump puts in, so that gotcha. we have a steady stream of uh, solution going up wow. towards the head. We have added things and, and extra checks, to sure. especially to try and stop any human error. Yeah. Um, but we had most of the the That's technical stuff in yeah, from, yeah, yeah. for a long time. Okay. Yeah. Um, so most of our heads are left side fed um, with three layers, but we can go up to five layers and a couple of our heads are centre fed. As we went wider, crossweb uniformity became an issue, so um, uh, some of our heads are, uh, are centre fed. But this is a picture of the coating head, so you can just about see the left side feed. There is actually three layers there, but because it's a white light product, the bottom two are the same colour. Gotcha. So you can only see two layers going down. We have inside, there'll be maybe two guys inside, one at the court and head, one at the unwind rewind. Sure. Um, can be very dark on film, obviously. Um, we have infrared cameras dotted through the process. So that in here, quite often, they can see much more than the guys who stood gotcha. next to the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Ian, can you just demonstrate the zoom in at the court and head? So this is our coating heads in position. So that's one of our 
Um, paper heads, because we're ready to coat paper. Um, left side feed, you can just about see. Okay, that, so this is inside the machine? This is inside yeah, the machine. Yeah. So there's the left side, the solutions will go up through there into yeah. the coating head. Right now, I, this is not infrared light, this is normal, this is white light This right is now? white light yeah, at yeah, the okay. moment, yeah. But when, when this machine is on and doing its thing, you can still see just yeah. like an infrared yeah. image basically. Yeah. Gotcha. And you can zoom in and out so you can look yeah. at edges. Um, Interesting. And we have various other cameras dotted through, yeah. through the machine. Quality control is probably the most important thing that any film manufacturer has to do. Because if you get a bad roll of film and you don't catch it, your entire batch might be screwed up and that's going to be a lot of pissed off customers. So Ilford does a lot of quality control and really prides itself on following the full process very thoroughly to ensure that its products are top quality. Uh, the Intex scanner is a laser system which scans in two different ways. On paper products yep. it scans as a reflection and on film products it scans as a transmission so the laser goes through okay. the sample. Uh, obviously it doesn't fog it. Then basically what it shows us is it, if we were filming mm -hmm. I've got a baseline signal there, which at the moment is just looking at raw base. Yeah. Then I have what we call a reconstructed signal. And what it's doing, it's trying to find any anomalies from its baseline. So at the moment, we're gonna get ready to coat on glossy. Yeah. If we're unfortunate to have any bubbles, as the laser is scanning across the glossy base, because there would be some emulsion missing, which yeah. is the bubble, then what would happen is the receiver that, in that area yeah. would receive more of the laser going into it gotcha. and it would go well, hey you know i've just received more laser than yeah, i should yeah. have done now depending on how many of those and the patterning of that because of obviously experience we know you know a certain pattern on just on the left hand side is likely to be a bubble feed coming yeah, yeah. in and then we can go looking on white light samples try and get as close as we can to it and confirm that that's what we're seeing gotcha, gotcha. and it records scans full width, scans full length of everything that we do and it will give us a running meterage as well yeah. and that gets printed out on uh, an old style way. printer <laughs> so you that know we when have... you were saying about old printers yes. Yes. <laughs> so you've got basically data points on every single correct yes how, how small of a data point are we talking here uh well that's the interesting question. It's, we can pick up bubbles that are as small as a millimetre, if not slightly sure, small. Sure. Gotcha. Especially when we're doing film on the transmission one, because the laser is travelling through the product. Yeah, yeah. So it's much easier for it to detect. Fibres, if you get like a, a hair, yeah, yeah, I've seen you for a bit. <laughs> if you have a hair that drops on, it will form a bubble in there as yeah. well, so we can find fibres. Yeah, okay. So, so it's quite precise. Basically. It is, it yeah. is precise. Yeah, yeah. It's, and then, of course, we can then determine when we're looking at it afterwards. Yeah. Okay, you might only have three or four in 1900 meters. Yeah, yeah. You get that. But if you've got yeah. sort of 100 in 1900 meters, There's a then we, yes, we then want to investigate. If we couldn't find anything straight away, yeah. we could stop coating yeah. until we can determine what's causing the problem. Gotcha. Doesn't this look like a big graveyard? Well, it kind of is. These are all called coffins, and basically they contain all of the fully sensitized paper or film that Ilford has produced. Um, none of this has been cut or packaged, obviously. It's just one giant roll. So these giant coffins keep them light, tight, and nice, safe, and secure. So now it's time for the fun part, where you get to see all the machines running around with film flying all over the place, falling into nice little packages that are eventually ready to be shipped out to customers all over the globe. This is the employee that ensures that packaging process goes nice and smoothly. you got to tell me who you are. I'm Gaynor Hill, production manager, and I've been here 39 years. That's why I wanted to ask you, 39 years. So you know a lot of experience I and, do, yes. you know, you're I knew it to the pretty process. well, yeah. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> right, so this is the CMU cassette making facility. Two processes. The first part of the process is from our supplier, we get a master sheet of um, printed metal. So it comes in on a pallet like so, in a big sheet like this. And this is, um, so it basically trims all four edges and then slices them into these strips yep. and they're prepared, ready to go onto the cassette making machine. The fact that Ilford can do all of this with the metal cassettes is extremely unique and important. 
They're one of the few facilities out there that can do every single part of the process end to end themselves without relying on any external vendors to create cassettes for them, for example. This is huge. This is 120 roll film. So from 14, we'll receive a parent roll. Mm -hmm. Upstairs, it's put onto the machine where it's put into pancakes. Around about 600 metres in length. Okay. And you've got your 120 width, okay? And oh, it comes, it's cut it comes down point. here, yeah. ready to be spooled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what's happening is, this is what we're making on here. Okay, so in there, there's your film. That's in a oh, light tight okay, magazine. Yeah, yeah. And that magazine is now sitting on there. Gotcha. It goes into this box here where it has the information put on, which is your frame numbers, yep. your grade. And how does that happen? Is that literally burned into the film? That's this light? So it's on, it's under a light, so it's exposed onto it's the exposed film. It's exposed directly so onto the film. So there'll be a negative on there. The light will shine through and then it'll just print onto the film. Gotcha, gotcha. So in that box, once you've had the information put on, the grades and the frame numbers, yep. It'll also be given a four-digit code that's unique to this batch only. Oh, wow. And that's okay. our identification. So if the customer just gives us that four-digit code, yeah, yeah, yeah. we know when, where, how, what for. Gotcha. So what happens is, on the machine, an unexposed label. Yeah, yeah. An exposed label. Exposed. Wrapper. Tape at the back. Oh, the infamous tape, yeah. <laughs> Film going up into here. Yep. And coming down here uh, is your spool. That's, that's ready at that point. Everything happens is, what happens is, there's your unexposed label on the outside. Take that off. Yep. I unwrap it. There's the tape sticking the film. Yep. And then you should have an exposed label, yep. which is there, attached to the spool, sorry. There. So that's all happening, all being accumulated into this one area here. This whole thing is quite relaxing, honestly. I love just standing there, listening to the sounds, watching the machines just repeat themselves over and over again. And each single time, out comes a nicely packaged, perfectly beautiful HP5 roll in 120. Just taking 10 films and wrapping it. Get the brick. Into a brick, like so. The infamous brick of HP5. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. So how many rolls of film do we get from here, like in an hour or something? Uh, so each each pancake takes mm -hmm. around about 40 minutes, 45 minutes to complete. Each one of these magazines? Each one of these magazines, yeah, yeah. and you can get around 500 to 600 spools off it. Okay. So in a day shift, in a six hour shift, we'll get about 5,000 of film. 5,000, okay. In a day, yeah. So of course we can't forget about 35 millimeter. The process is definitely a bit different given that the film is in a cassette, but the principles are basically the same. The film gets shoved into the cassette, the cassette is then housed in a plastic container, and then that plastic container gets put in a cardboard box, ready for shipping. And that's about it. The film now just sits there in the dark, waiting for you, the photographer, to load it into a camera and pop off some shots. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. It was a lot of fun going over there and talking to everybody there and just learning about the whole process. It's honestly an incredible place and so much history and so much old school stuff happening in there. That's obviously still relevant today for us film shooters. If you enjoyed the video, please click the like button below. And of course, leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. All right, y'all, to the next video. I'm out. <laughs>